card. And I am going to present. Okay. Hi, everyone. This is Megan Zarki, your New York State PTA Education Coordinator. I'm Tina Sheck, the New York State PTA Special Education Coordinator. And I'm Lisa Zukoff, New York State PTA Family Engagement Coordinator. Hi, everyone. We're so excited to be here to present a workshop based upon transitions, different needs for different ages. And um, the three of us came together to present to you about the transitions that you'll see throughout the special education continuum in prior to K and K through 12 and beyond. Um, but just to give you an idea of who we're talking about, um, we've got my two right in the left-hand side here, um, my kindergartner and my second grader. And then here in the middle are my three boys. They are right now in seventh, ninth, and 12th grade. So I'm all about the transitions. And I actually have three children, but I only have one picture here. This is my little guy um, who's 13. Um, who is um, special needs. And I also have two children, um, one in graduate school and one in a junior in college, also special needs students. So I've gone beyond the transition now. So um, we definitely have a wide variety of experience going on between the three of us. Absolutely. Um, so just to kind of give you an idea of these transitions that we're going to be speaking about in this um, workshop for you, um, there are four pretty big transitions that you'll likely see as a special education parent as well as your child. Um, we included CPSE because that is a part of a huge transition from preschool special education to the world of CSE, Committee on Special Education, when your child enters kindergarten. Um, there are some little differences as you enter a secondary setting, middle school, junior high, high school. Um, and there are definitely some huge transitions um, beyond high school. Um, you know, it's CSE does end with high school graduation or when the child ages out at 21, whichever one of those comes first. So to start us off, because I'm very much in the midst of the CPSE to CSE transition, both of my children um, have special needs. Um, my kindergartner has ADHD and developmental coordination disorder. And my second grader is on the autism spectrum with a side of ADHD. So this is very much in the realm of what I'm working with now with my two children. So when you're getting ready to enter um, a kindergarten setting, a K through 12 public school setting, um, please be sure that the preschool placement and the service provider updates all testing ahead of this transition because some of that testing could really make or break um, what services your child will be receiving upon entering their first steps into that kindergarten building in September. Start the conversation as early as you can. Um, get in touch with the school psychologist, the social worker, if you happen to have an inkling beforehand of what setting your child is going to be placed in, whether it's gen ed, um, integrated co-teaching or ICT or um, special class, um, which tends to be more of a self-contained setting of special education, start to even see if you can reach out to the teachers of those classes as well to kind of get a feel for the placement for the classroom. Um, I would highly encourage also visiting the school building that your child will be entering in September to get that relationship going right away. Um, I know many of us with special needs children are well aware of the need to save every single document that you receive, whether it's from a service provider, psychoeducational testing, or um, even from doctors that are diagnosing various um, disabilities like ADHD and developmental coordination disorder and the like. Um, make a document binder. 
and make it in chronological order, it is beyond helpful when you're sitting at the table trying to figure out something. And you can flip back to that document, that speech evaluation that you had done while your child was three years old to either indicate the need for newer testing or to show growth and such and such. Um, it's also helpful to create a Google Drive folder with all of these important docs and reports because life has a funny way of making things unfortunately disappear or get misplaced. Leave that, um, scan it in, set a folder. You've got it for as long as you have your Google Drive. Um, you definitely prior to the CSC transition want to get to know what the 13 classifications in special education are. Um, that's going to become important for maintaining that IEP in kindergarten. And shameless plug for PTA, um, but if you're not already a member of your district's um, special ed PTA unit or SEPTA, join them. Um, as we know, unit membership is open to anybody. If you don't have a SEPTA unit in your district, start asking, start making plans to charter one because there's always a need for more SEPTA units in each of our districts to support parents such as ourselves going through various transitions with our kids. So I touched upon this a few moments ago. Here are the 13 categories of special education. Um, one of the most popular ones that I see is that OHI, other health impairment. Um, and so your child, in order, like I said, to maintain one of those, um, to maintain an IEP in kindergarten and beyond, they have to fall into one of these categories of special education. But never fear, if your child does not fit into one of these categories, they can still qualify for a 504 accommodation plan. Um, the real big difference between an IEP and accommodation plan is usually the IEP has very specific services, whether they're pull out, push in um, for that particular disability. A 504 accommodation plan, you tend to see more for children who may not need support services, but they still need support in the classroom with, say, extra time on tests, um, you know, larger print on um, worksheets and the like. So just to get familiar with those before you start the transition. So now your child has started kindergarten. You had your um, transition meeting, um, whether it's the spring or summer before kindergarten. So this way they can adequately prep for your child's presence in the building come September for your child's needs. Um, something that I'm actually in the throes of right now with my kindergartner is a triennial evaluation. Schools are required to evaluate children with IEPs every three years. Um, this is where the psychologist, the classroom teacher, um, and other service providers should be doing new evaluations on your child. So this way, when you come to the table to see if the level of services is appropriate or it needs to be bumped up, you have that most recent data so that they're not basing it off of when your child was in preschool. We know three years a child can show tremendous growth. But every three years, you will have a triennial evaluation that results in a CSE. What if something comes up in the meantime, after you've set that IEP up and you think it's ironclad, you've got everything that your child needs on there, they start kindergarten and a whole host of other things start to happen, which is actually something recent that happened with my kindergartner. You as the parent or your child's teacher can formally request that your child be evaluated or reevaluated for a service um, at any time. It doesn't have to coincide with an annual review or a triennial evaluation. If you see that your child is struggling and you want to get that speech evaluation done after you've had a CSE, you are entitled to request that it be done by um, by the school district. So speaking of testing, 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 um, there are a whole bunch of tests that you can request for your child along the way. Um, we know the typical OTPT speech. Um, a couple that 
are important to know as special education parents. Um, the first one may be a familiar term to many of you, a functional behavior assessment, otherwise called as an FBA. Um, typically that results in a, a BIP, a behavior improvement plan that helps to target specific behaviors in the classroom that um, will help your, um, to target specific behaviors that are going on in the classroom and trying to figure out what strategies you can use to help the child learn a new way of managing. Um, another big one that I don't feel many special education parents necessarily are aware of are the independent educational evaluations or IEEs. Those can also be requested at any time where you can formally request in a letter to your um, special education chair, or assistant superintendent who takes care of special education. It doesn't have to be based off of a service your child is receiving at school. This is an opportunity for you to request testing that goes above and beyond what they can provide in the building, what the service providers and teachers are trained for. For example, um, a very popular, popular use of IEEs is to request a full neuropsychological workup if you suspect that there is more at play than um, your ADHD or autism or anything like that. Um, you can also ask for an IEE for um, OTPT speech testing that goes above and beyond what the building is able to provide in terms of testing there. So um, very important to have that in your back pocket. Um, and common related services that you tend to see, um, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech language, counseling, parent training, there are certain classifications among the 13 categories of special education, where if your child has that um, classification on their IEP, parent training is required. I'm thinking autism off the top of my head. Um, resource room is a common related service. Um, there's many more that we could have listed here. Um, remember, you can always request an evaluation for these and any other service at any point. It does not have to coincide with when the annual review is scheduled to take place or a triennial review. Could happen in March, could happen in July, whenever you as the parent can make the formal request to your district for evaluation. And so you got through the first year of public school, private school, what happens after kindergarten? Well, as it goes for anything, communication is key. Um, use that remind that your child's classroom teacher has for communication, um, you know, email, at, um, Constantly stay in touch, especially if there are any sort of behavior or physical educational changes. Keep in touch with and maintain great relationships with their teachers. Um, your child's needs may change at any time. Just because your child needs that PT three times a week in kindergarten, it you know the service could potentially be reduced if your child does make considerable progress. Um, Listen to teachers and service providers. They have the most in-school experience with your child. I know some of us got a glimpse of that a little bit more over the past year and a half with various learning modalities in our schools in New York State. Um, but the people that are seeing this the most during the school day are teachers and service providers. If they're telling you that something is happening or not happening, believe them and follow through but also be prepared for some disagreements about your child's needs when advocating. Um, there have been times where I've disagreed with the amount of service that my child one or one of my children receives. Um, it's not the time to yell, kick or scream. It's the time to have the conversation. And if you disagree, you have other things at your fingertips to request further testing and things like that. So, I am going to turn it over to Lissa, who is going to talk to you about what happens in middle school. Moving on to middle school. Thank you, Megan. There's a lot of changes and it's important to know that when we're going into middle school, I'm aware that in our very diverse state, 
not everybody is leaving the building. There are some children that are in the same building all the way through. Um, there are some that may have switched throughout the grades, but for the most part, a lot, many of our children are in fifth or sixth grade. They're transitioning to a new building and they're moving on to one of the biggest shifts in K through 12 education because they're going from being in one classroom all day with one teacher in, in an environment they've been in for many years to going into switching class to class, changing teachers, going to a lunchroom, usually in a bigger environment with new students. It's very intimidating. It's very scary. And for, as parents and also as the children. So we want to make sure everybody is good to go. So you're going to have a transition meeting going from your old school to the new school. It may even be in some school districts, it's a different school district completely from the elementary to the high school district. So this is a really important meeting because you want everything to carry through. You wanna make sure both schools are appropriately represented. You, that appropriately, I mean, not just necessarily the CSE chair. If you feel that your child would benefit from having a, the new school nurse at the meeting, or the, the, you have an incoming teacher, school psychologist, you have to feel comfortable that the child's needs are going to be met on both ends in this conversation. So when you get that invitation, look at who's on it and feel free to request and reach out to other people to join. You also want to reach out to the school psychologist or CSE chair after the meeting. They're going to get to know you. They're going to get to know the teachers. They're going to get to know what your child needs. But as time goes on and as this transition happens, this connection is going to be important. These people you're going to deal with regularly. You want to trust them. They want to trust you. You want to start to build that friendship, that relationship, because there's give and take on both ends. But the truth is you need a paper trail. It matters. You want to keep that schoolwork to measure the growth make note of the, any struggles that are going on with homework or schoolwork and share those concerns because this meeting might be happening in January and February. In fact, likely it is. So it could be happening six months before your child is going to this new school. So now there's going to be new concerns and new needs and those needs matter and they need to be addressed. So that's where you're keeping this connection with the school psychologist and the CSE chair. Don't be afraid to email. If you feel you would like to CC them on a particular concern with your current share, you can do that. This, the best thing is to share information to make this transition go as smooth as possible. The IEP can always be changed. Even if the school year hasn't begun, you can still change it. This program, it's important to be accurate and on point for your child's best start. So make the summer count. This is how you can start to make it a little bit easier and a little less painful. First of all, the building. You want to tour the building and the grounds. Let your child get familiar to where it is. Let you get familiar. Where does the bus get off? If there's a neighbor who's been taking the bus, ask them. Maybe they can share some tips or where the best place to stand is. It makes it a little more exciting. You want to gain familiarity with the important locations. So definitely reach out beforehand and see, get a tour of that building. Find out where the guidance office is, the school psychologist, the principal, the bathroom, the nurse, all these places that are gonna need to go. You're also gonna wanna walk the schedule when you get it, but that usually doesn't come until later, but you could spend time during the summer working on it. There may be summer work. A lot of middle schools have summer reading, as high schools do as well. So find out what those assignments are in advance and then arrange for appropriate supports. If it's schoolwork, your child needs support, your child's entitled to those supports. They, if you feel that your child needs services over the summer, that's something to mention in the meeting and they can have summer services. That is something to be discussed and determined, but if your child's going to have schoolwork that needs to be done and needs support, that's something that has to be arranged and you should be able to make sure your child's not starting school feeling already behind or a little bit nervous. Accommodations. So, you know, when you're talking about navigating the building, well, maybe before they were in one classroom and they weren't moving around that much, maybe for lunch or specials, now they're going from class to class. You need to make sure physically the child can get around safely, that they know where everything is and that they're not going to get harmed. So you need to double check that IEP and when you actually walk the building, make sure that everything was taken into consideration because you might not have known about a stairway 
when you originally made those decisions that you need to know now. Whatever your child's needs are, they need to be met. And the locker, that's a sneaky one. Because many kids, most kids haven't had a locker. And even if they do, now the locker is that turn combination. And if your child has fine motor deficits or hasn't worked with it, it's hard to do. So a tip is for some kids, what really does help is putting a rubber band around the locker because it gives them something to grip onto when they're turning it. And if you have one at home, let them practice. But if that's not going to work, if they just can't do it, or it's causing them so much stress, reach out to the guidance counselor or the social worker and find out if you can get that lock changed. They can usually modify, obviously they can modify that combination. So maybe it would be one where the, the numbers line up where it's not as much twitching, twirling. So find out what you could do, but do whatever you can to alleviate that concern and make sure your child can really get comfortable and enjoy the beginning of school. And talking about easing anxiety, speak, speak to your child. Your son or your daughter probably has something that they're very concerned about. Maybe that they're worried about new, losing some old friends or gaining new friends, or maybe it's something that you never even considered. So definitely talk to them and try to brainstorm some possible resolutions and some ways to resolve it. So give them that confidence, but making sure that your child knows you're there, you're listening, and that it's so typical and normal to feel nervous. This is a big change for all of us. And as a parent, you're going to feel really nervous too. That's okay. That's really okay. So we've made it through the summer and school is in session. So these are a few things that I do and that we can suggest you do to make the things go smooth. First of all, email all the teachers. So now you have a lot of teachers, right? I always email the teachers. I share if there's any pertinent or important information about your child's needs, about what has to happen. One of my children is a type one diabetic, so there are some needs there. This is all in the IEP, or if your child has a 504, but you wanna make sure that it gets out there. And I also attach a copy of the IEP. That way the teacher doesn't have to go searching for it. And I've given them my contact information my cell phone and my email so that they're open to communication and they know how to reach me if they need to. And you want to humanize yourself. You're a person, right? And your child, they're getting a lot of new students in the classroom. So here you're now going to introduce your child and make sure they know who your child is and what their needs are. It's, it's important. So it's also important to kind of arrange for a meeting of the minds because as we discussed, we don't know what's going to happen when school starts. There's lots of changes. You would want to arrange a team meeting for four to six weeks after the start of school. And that's something that you would, should have put in the IEP when you had that transition meeting. But if it's not there, reach out if that's something you feel needs to happen and get that started. Now we've been doing so many things virtually. It actually can be done so much more easily. It can be done virtually. But let's touch base, see where your child is, see what you're noticing at home, where it go back and forth, have that conversation. Make sure that whatever is in place is appropriate, that you don't need to revisit anything and that you don't need to check of any changes, such as new evaluation. Now, Megan spoke about a lot of evaluations, right, that took place. And maybe you did those during elementary school and your child got some services but didn't qualify for other services. And, it, you know, it's, it, your, your child grows and change their needs grows and changes, as does the criteria for supports, because there's a big jump now. There's more expected of your child. For example, my son received OT. He received it in EI and CPSE. Once he started elementary school with CSE, he no longer qualified. I really felt he needed it. He struggled with fine motor skills. He struggled with his handwriting. And I did request evaluations, and he just did not qualify. First month of seventh grade, he brings home assignment from his science teacher with a note that all the answers were correct, but that he couldn't read his name and he couldn't read some of the words and he was going to have to take points off. And that was all that I really needed to start that conversation all over again, because now there's new needs, right? And they're expecting more of these students. So I had that document, I went and looked at all his work and I noticed where I found things were of concern. I emailed the school, 
I mentioned that one of the teachers had had this concern and I requested a new OT evaluation and that we have this conversation. And you can do the same and you should say every piece of work. You, that way you could see what's gone on from elementary school, you know, the past six months to now. And especially if you see something of concern or if the teacher says something to you. And I will say, whatever evaluations that you're conducting, if it does involve OT, I highly recommend you ask for an assistive technology evaluation as well. That's going to evaluate their way to use that technology, right? And to get everything where it should be. Because if their problem is handwriting, maybe they need a Chromebook. Maybe they need some other assistive technology. And that's how they're going to have it. And it's a fascinating evaluation. So that's something to keep in mind. And there may even be something, maybe a physical therapy evaluation. Maybe you notice your child's having trouble navigating the hallways or they're tripping. There's another safety concern. There are so many ways as this year goes on, as this change continues, as teachers who aren't as familiar with your child get to know them, that you're going to notice concerns. And there is nothing wrong with going out and asking for an evaluation and having that conversation to see what you could do to best support your child. And if I may, I will suggest if you're in elementary school, as Megan was saying, and you're having some evaluations done then, and your child does qualify for assistive technology, especially for something like OT, ask what the middle school and high school are using, because sometimes if your child's a year or so out of going to the new school, and the elementary school uses an iPad, let's say, but the middle school uses a Chromebook, your child may be better off getting started on that Chromebook that they're going to be utilizing in the next year or so um, going on into middle and high school. So find out what a technology is being used in the districts so that you can best prepare your child as you move on. And all of that is a discussion that you can have and that you could share. And part of that training, if your child does qualify, is training for you and your child to use that device properly. This is all something that you are entitled to have to best support your child and help them learn. So now, independence is a big thing that's happening, right? Now they're navigating these hallways. They're going from class to class. They have to grow up, and, and you want them to. You want them to be more independent. So now you're going to start changing how you help them. So perhaps at night, write a checklist for those daily supplies they need to take with them so that they know they're not leaving an ID at home because they, maybe they need that ID to get in or maybe they need their water bottle or a calculator, whatever it is. You want to set alarms for wake up. Even if you're also waking up your child, perhaps they don't listen to the alarm, get them used to this. This routine has to start. So right now, maybe you're across, you're supporting them, but eventually, hopefully they can do it independently and you want them to be able to do that. You also, the bus schedule. If your child is bus, they may need to be familiar about what time they have to leave the house by. So maybe set a second alarm that's going to set off five minutes before they have to leave so they know to start putting their coat on and get their bag together. It's all important. I will tell you, I had one child who constantly forgot his ID. He could not, no matter how many times we did it, we put it in his bag. It would get taken out when he was looking for something else. We ended up putting a post-it note on the front door and it worked wonders, that post-it note, because he saw it every day before he left. So maybe put on the post-it note if there's a couple of things that you want your child, a house key that you, they need to take with them, put it on that post-it note. And I may also suggest that if your child's going to be coming home by themselves for the first time and they do have a tendency to lose or misplace things, you may want to look into a lock that moves with a combination with numbers that they could press in. And then you don't have to worry about them losing a key. They can let themselves in. Self-advocacy. So now there's going to be that level of independence, right? If they have a concern at school, you want them to communicate with their teachers, you want them to understand how and who they are. So for example, if your child's struggling with a homework assignment and they maybe they don't understand a question, where in the past you would maybe reach out to the teacher, let your child reach out to the teacher. And if your child struggles with communication and it's very difficult for them to verbalize or they can't verbalize or they need some time to think, let them email when they come home. I know that one of my children feels much better emailing their teachers. He's able to be independent and ask for help or follow up on a question or an assignment 
but in the classroom with all the other students around and trying to form it, formulate what they want to say and respond appropriately and hear, it becomes very confusing. But when he's home and it's quiet, he can send an email. And you can certainly proofread that email if you feel that that's appropriate, but give your child a chance to advocate and work on their own. Also let them understand their IEP and their diagnosis. It's, it's so important, it's so important. We all you know, have to be open and honest about all of ourselves and who we are. And in middle school and into high school, your child's going to be invited at some point to be part of the CSE meeting. They're gonna be part of that conversation, which is incredible. So they want to, you don't wanna surprise them with anything. And many, many times, right at the beginning of school, the middle school will sit them down with their IEP to explain what their um, supports are if they get you know, extended testing. And they're going to see that document. And if they're not already aware of anything on it, it can be a bit jarring. So make sure that your child is prepared. And of course, organization, which goes back into this whole independence and self-advocacy. We need to be able to take care of our stuff. So the school will usually provide an agenda. If not, make sure you get one where all the homework is written down. Otherwise, it's being done electronically. Our school um, suggested, and it worked for my children, which is an A and PM binder. And so they put all of the morning classes in one binder and then the afternoon classes in another. And during lunch, they switch over. It was a little less confusing to have lots of different notebooks and or too many subjects in one huge notebook. So that's something to consider. And schedules. Print out the schedule, put it in the front of a notebook so that it's easy for your child to, to see, take a picture of it on their phone, have it be accessible. So during that first time in school going the hallway, they know where they have to go and when. Ooh, that's a lot of information, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just a brief overview of DASA, which is the Dignity, Dignity for All Students Act. This seeks to provide the state's public elementary and secondary stu school students with a safe, supportive environment free from discrimination, intimidation, taunting, harassment, and bullying on school property, a school bus, and or at a school function. There's lots of information on it, but it's just it's important to know that now your child's going to be with new people in a different environment. There's going to be more unstructured time nobody deserves to be bullied and there are options and there are ways for you to protect your child and this is just something to keep in mind okay now we're heading to high school guys we're gonna keep on going now as we're going to high school we're building on these building blocks that we did in middle school right so we're just going to continue on a lot of this we're going to over the summer if it's a different building we're going to visit the building we're going to tour Definitely work with uh, the staff on both buildings if there's going to be a transition. You want to do everything like we did between going to, seven, to middle school, going into high school. We're just going to build on it. Maybe your child's a little more independent and a part of that conversation, and you can ask what they need to know. But always keep going. And every year, in the beginning of the year, you send that email to every single teacher introduce yourself, introduce your child, and send a copy of the IEP. That's what I always do. Yes, the school is going to share the IEP with the students, and if you're not comfortable emailing it with the teachers, if you're not comfortable emailing it, they will get it. But it's always, for me, I like having that level of comfort that while I'm introducing myself and talking about my child, if they want to see it, it's right in front of them. Now, for students on a testing track, when they're going into high school, Testing accommodation should be sent to the College Board as early as possible. The College Board is where they're going to take eventually AP classes. It's where the SAT is through. So follow up with the School Guidance Department. They'll usually take care of that for you, but you want to make sure it's getting done because the PSAT is being taken as early as 10th grade and then the SAT in 11th. And so you want to get that in. It does take some time, and the College Board has a lot of regulations about what they can, how to get those testing accommodations. And so I would definitely follow up right away with the school staff and certainly with the um, College Board. There's more information. You could take a look over there. So you're setting the stage for the future here, right? There's no one size fits all in education. You need to advocate what's best for your child. Not every child's going to go to college. There's so many options out there. And a lot of what 
Tina is going to be talking about shortly is going to be getting your child ready for all of these options. So I'm not going to get into those kinds of details because you have so much exciting stuff to learn from Tina. But what I do want to share is that as we're continuing to build on these blocks and as we're planning your child's future, don't get locked into what other people think is the right answer. You have to listen to your child and you have to listen to yourself and your family and do what is right. Every child's going to be successful. Every single one of them. Look at how much they are doing. Look how far they've come. Think about it. Every single year, rather than looking, you know, if you worry about what your child's not doing, think about where they were, what, what they've come through, what you've learned. It's so important to really appreciate and have value for what has happened so far. And everything that we do moving forward is just going to build on this and to give your child more options and more skills and ways to continue moving forward. Also make sure your school is gonna have a transition coordinator. So maybe put space with them, social worker, the guidance counselor. You wanna make sure as your child's moving through the years that everything's in place, that they're where they need to be on track for graduation, or where they'll need to be on track for the next step. And Tina will go into a lot of detail on that next. Um, but whatever happens, your child's going to be incredibly successful. And here Thanks, goes Lisa. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. Uh, what happens after high school and beyond? Um, there's so much information going on. Uh, first off, as Lisa mentioned, every, every student has a different path. There is no one step path for everybody. So what I'm going to touch on are the diploma options that are available to your um, high school students. So the first one on, next slide, Megan, um, is, so if your child's on for a diploma um, track, a high school diploma gives them access to college, the military, trade schools, and the two most common diplomas in New York State are the Regents Diploma and the Local Diploma. So your child could potentially graduate with one of these two options. There's also a non-diploma option. The difference between a non-diploma option and a diploma option is these credentials um, replace what we used to know uh, many years ago as the IEP diploma, which is no longer offered. On their own, the CDOS, the SACC credentials are not high school diplomas and cannot be used to apply to college, the military, trade school, or even civil service jobs. So uh, just to touch, as everybody knows in the special education field of acronyms, the CDOS stands for Career Development and Occupational Studies, which is known as the CDOS. And um, the Skills and Achievement Commencement Credentials, SACC. This option is only available if your student takes the New York State Alternative Assessment Track. So those students that are alternatively assessed will potentially um, leave their high school educational career with the SACC. So as most of you probably know under IDEA, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, um, is the nation's special education law. It gives rights and protections to kids with disabilities. It covers them from birth through high school graduation or age 21, whichever comes first. So if your special needs student um, needs to stay in high school for a little bit longer, they are allowed to stay until the age of, the age of 21. There are different options for students with IEPs when doing their IEP transition planning. The goals in the IEP transition plan state what a student would like to achieve after high school at these IEP meetings. Your students should be invited to attend and participate in the planning process. Lisa touched on this and said how important it is for your child to become aware of what his or her disabilities are, um, what their, um, and it's important for the community to know what their goals might be. They might want to um, have a goal. For my son, he wants to be a chef. You know, he potentially wants to become a chef. So, you know, we want to um, make sure that we stress skills in math and, um, you know, in family consumer science field. And those are things that, you know, you want to take into consideration when you're um, planning his goals for his IEP. So the goals can be vocational training, like I mentioned, learning a trade. Um, in particular, for my son, we're kind of focusing on him possibly going into the culinary trade. Uh, Post-secondary education, if your child decides to go to college or any other, other type of educational institution, a local community college, um, a, a, a trade, um, learning a specific trade, uh, jobs and employment could also be a goal, um, independent living if necessary. Um, this quote I want to share with all of you, it kind of touched me, 
Whatever you choose for a career path, remember the struggles along the way are only meant to shape you for your purpose. So all our kids are going to struggle, but we are there to support them and help them through those struggles and find their path. So that's really important to keep in mind. Um, so going on, in New York State, every student with a disability who has an IEP is entitled to transition services. What are transfers? Oh, sorry, what are transition services at the high school level? Transition services are services that help the student move from school to post-secondary education, a job, vocational training, adult services, independent living, and community involvement. In New York State, transition planning should begin by the time they turn 15. So when your child, so that's about when they're leaving middle school or possibly entering high school, uh, the conversation should have started on what are we going to do with my child once you know they, they age out or they graduate from high school. Your student's IEP should describe what that their goal is for after high school. If your student's IEP does not include goals for after high school or any mention of transition services, contact your CSE chairperson or coordinator and request, request in writing to have these added to the IEP. Um, Megan touched on it, Lisa touched on it. It is so important to put everything in writing. Um, I know sometimes it's easier to make a phone call and leave a message, but when you do that, you have no record that you reached out and you requested these services or these testings or these changes. So it's really important to put everything into writing. So what is transitional services? Um, transitional services are coordinated by either a transition coordinator or a transition linkage coordinator um, if your school district has one. Um, you'll usually see the term transition linkage coordinator if you're in the New York City school system. Um, and most other areas in the state use a trans they um, term the title transition services coordinator. If your district or school doesn't have one, um, it's usually the guidance counselor in your school. And some of the transition services that they can help you with are internships, vocational training, help applying to college and financial aid services, helping to find a job or work program, how to get to the job or program, help to get a driver's license, life skills. Examples would be including learning how to use money, how to pay bills, um, interviewing skills, um, housing options or programs. There, there are so many services that are available to our children, especially when they get to that young adult stage, including um, when they're planning, if they're planning to go to college, there are specific um, financial aid, there's specific um, scholarships available. So all this can be helped with your transition coordinator. Uh, please remember that transition services when leaving school are much different than when the top student was in school. There is no right to a job, day program, or housing once the student leaves school. That's why it is so important to get started on how to um, obtain these services before they leave, leave the high school of their educational careers behind. How do I know what services my students will need? There are many assessments and tests that can be done, and I know we touched on so many tests, and unfortunately, as a special needs parents, we know it's all about the testing and all about the data. Um, so there is testing that can be done to determine what areas your student needs support. It is important for you to have an updated triannual, just like Megan had mentioned, done before your student graduates or ages out. And this is really important, and I could even share my own personal experience. When my daughter uh, left for college, her college was willing to look at the IEP and possibly provide accommodations, but they wanted the testing that was most recently done in the last year. So it's really important before your student leaves um, their educational careers behind that they have the most updated testing available. So some of the testing that could be done at this level are level one vocational assessment. This should be done every year after the student turns 12, and this is actually required by state and law. Level two and three vocational assessments are available, but they're not required and done by request only, and they're much more in depth than a level one assessment. You could do an occupational therapy assessment. This is different, just like Lisa had mentioned, than what might have been assessed when your child was in preschool and elementary. An OT assessment can show they can get dressed, organize their papers, time management, and many other life skills. Speech language. Speech also changes at this age. Does the student have social skills? Can they self-advocate and have other communication skills that they need in order to survive? Assistive technology, as we've mentioned, is really important. Can technology help your students reach their goals and their potential? So that's why it's really important to have all this testing done. Uh, below, you'll see a link to the New York State Ed um, special, um, special page on transitional services. So that's just for all of you to take a look at um, when you have time. As 
we all know there's a lot of reading involved, so there's pages and pages of um, information there for you to go through. So this, I just want to share with you sample IEP transition plans. As you can see, um, of course, with your own school district, it, it could be totally different, but this kind of shows you what, um, what goals might be, um, what transitional services are available for that, and what person or agency that could provide that transition services. So these are just samples for you to take a look at um, and, and kind of compare and see what might potentially you might be able to ask for. So these are other resources that can help. Um, transition source is actually um, intended for use by parents, professionals, and others in New York State to obtain transition information. Transition source is managed by the Transition Services Professional Development Support Center and funded by New York State Ed. You could uh, set up a profile. You could actually see what kind of transition testing there is, transition um, agencies and sources, um, paperwork, laws. It's a great website for you to start a profile and take a look. As you probably all heard, Access VR, VR standing for vocational rehabilitation, assists individuals with disabilities to achieve and maintain employment and to support independent living through training, education, rehabilitation, and career development. Um, your high school student actually through Access VR, if they qualify, could get driver's ed, um, special driver's ed education professionals that work with students with special needs to obtain their driver's license. Access VR could actually even potentially help your college student pay for books if there are special materials that they need in order to learn. So Access VR is an important source to look into. The other thing that most um, special needs um, parents know about is OPWDD, um, Office of People with Developmental Disabilities, can help those individuals that qualify with community rehabilitation, job placement, support through service providers, and many other benefits you might qualify for services. OPWDD, I will not lie to you, is a very long process. I recommend that you start that process as soon as possible and to see if your child qualifies. Literally, my own personal experience, it might not be the same for everybody else. I'm in my third year of trying to obtain full services uh, for my son. And it, it's a very long process. And they also require a lot of testing, a lot of data, a lot of information. So. It's something you don't want to start when your child turns 18. It's a process you do want to start as soon as possible. Another resource is Office of Mental Health, OMH. Offers mental health counseling for those with mental health disabilities, but also provides help with job training, housing, skills training, and additional support services. There's also the Social Security Administration. It gives federal benefits to people of any age with a significant mental or physical disability, which some of our students do qualify for. These benefits include Social Security Disability Insurance, Supplemental Security Income, and plans to achieve self-support, Medicaid, and Medicare, which is very important for all of our um, children to have. Things to remember if your child is heading to college. Colleges do not have IEPs or 504 plans. An IEP ends when a student graduates from high school or ages out of the system. Please remember, colleges are not required to follow 504 or IEP plans, but most colleges uh, will take a look. Colleges are not required to provide accommodations, believe it or not. It is going to be up to your child to advocate for themselves and ask for those accommodations. They may ask to see your IEP as a guide to see what services you did receive in high school. It is the student's responsibility to ask for accommodations and services. Remember, again, the college university will not discuss your student or his accommodations without signed consent. Remember, when your student goes off to college, you are now considered a legal adult. So the colleges will not speak to you unless they have written consent from your student. Every college and university does have an Office of Disabilities. However, you need to research what services they provide. There are some universities out there that have an extensive disabilities office that are amazing. But then there are other colleges that aren't as up to date. Uh, they, it might be a small office within a bigger building. and there might not be as many accommodations available. Some services you'll have to pay for in addition to the basic tuition. So please be aware of that. Examples of services that colleges and universities might provide are extended time on test assignments, a note taker, where there's a fellow student that's actually hired to take notes for your child, separate testing rooms if they need a separate testing room accommodation, recording of lectures. You can only do that with express permission from the professor that's giving the lecture in that particular class large font or on educational materials in case they have a visual disability, 
for me, I will share personally with my daughter. Um, she has a, a problem with transitioning from copying notes onto her uh, into her notebook or her binder. So her college, um, her office of disabilities at her university actually uh, purchased one of those recording pens where she could record and take notes and it highlights everything um, on the paper and transfers it immediately into her laptop. And her uh, college was willing to purchase that for her. And basically she returned it in the summer and they provided for her for the entire academic year. So those are the things you want to discuss when you're touring colleges. See what the Office of Disabilities is like. What are the additional supports and accommodations do they have available? What are the extra charges they're going to charge? Because it is going to be an additional fee that you're going to have to think about when you're figuring out, can I afford this college? So it's something to keep into mind. Um, the other thing I also kind of share with a lot of parents is before, and this is for special needs or neurotypical students, is actually have a power of attorney for your child, a medical power of attorney. Because when they go off to college and God forbid something happens, um, the hospital's not required to contact you because they're considered adults. You wanna be able to get that information if your child is in an emergency situation. So, and it's as simple as finding, let's say your child goes to this uh, college in the state of Virginia, go to the uh, Virginia website and look up um, a power of attorney, a health uh, healthcare proxy. And it's actually something as easy as having it printed, you both sign it and have it notarized by a local notary. So it's something really important to have just in your back pocket in case God forbid something happens. Um, at the end of this, all the transition, all the testing, all the meetings, you should be provided with a student exit, uh, exit summary. IDEA requires schools to provide a student with a disability with a summary of the student's academic achievement, functional performance, which should include recommendations on how to assist the student so they can continue to succeed upon the termination of services because of graduation or aging out. Exit summary should include recent testing, evaluations, and transcripts. And I gave a little bit of a sample of an exit summary. In some districts, it might actually look like more of a letter, like a letter of conclusion, um, you know, but it should include what your child was able to succeed, what additional testing or accommodations they may need, what help they may need, and what the end goal was when they're leaving their educational um, institution behind. And so this is actually a link to the New York State um, um, link about information about student exit summaries. So you could kind of take a look at that. And it's kind of sad because that's kind of when we say goodbye and we move on to the next stage of their lives. And I think on the next slide, Megan. Um, We hope that our um, presentation today was informational and it only just scratches the surface of the world of special education in preschool and post-secondary worlds. Um, if you have any questions about any of those stages, um, our New York State PTA um, emails are there. Mine, um, Lissa's and Tina's, feel free to reach out to us. Um, and it doesn't have to necessarily be about the section that we specialize in because of where our particular children are in. Um, if you have any other questions about education, special education or family engagement issues um, in your community, within your unit, your council, your region, please feel free to share, reach out to us. Um, I hope that you are enjoying your convention experience and we hope to see you soon. Take care, everyone.